It is my pleasure to highlight the diverse research and contributions to translational science from our campus partners across the Indiana CTSI. And I'd like to get started uh, by introducing each of the four campus speakers. Um, starting with our first speaker, who traveled here from South Bend, Dr. Nancy Michael from the University of Notre Dame, will be speaking on translating neuroscience for collective impact. Dr. Michael is the Reverend John A. Zom, CS, or excuse me, CSC, Associate Teaching Professor at the University of Notre Dame and has also served as the Director of Undergraduate Studies, Neuroscience and Behavior since December of 2014. During her time as faculty, Dr. Michael's dedication to excellence, innovation and education, and commitment to community wellness have earned her numerous teaching, advising, and community awards. Notably, in collaboration with multiple community organizations, she has worked in partnership to cultivate engagement with self-healing communities of Greater Michiana, a collective impact community capacity building model aimed at mitigating the impact of toxic stress on individuals and communities through elevating the neuroscience of human resilience. Her primary role in this coalition is to spearhead the collaborative development of population-specific NEAR, or Neuroscience, Epigenetics, Adverse Childhood Experiences, and Resilience, science resources, and professional development strategies to support individual, organizational, and community capacity building. Next, from our Indiana University Bloomington campus is Kaisuka Kawaka, speaking on interdisciplinary neurotrauma research functional and cellular biomarkers to inspect brain health. Dr. Kawata is an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Program in Neuroscience at Indiana University Bloomington. His undergraduate days were dedicated to sports medicine and athletic training, while his master's and PhD at Temple University focused on molecular and clinical neuroscience to understand cellular and functional consequences of traumatic brain injury especially subconcussive neurodegeneration. This means he is both a clinician, neuroscientist, and sports medicine practitioner, and has extensive experience working in a variety of national sports settings, such as NFL Detroit Lions, among many others. He currently conducts diverse research projects related to brain resiliency and vulnerability using fluid biomarkers, cognitive and sensor function, and advanced neuro neuroimaging approaches. Traveling from West Lafayette, we have Dr. Maria Dadarlat from our Purdue campus, speaking on from physio physiology to psychophysics, developing a novel behavioral task to assess neurophysiological damage following minor traumatic brain injury. Dr. Dadarlat is an assistant professor of biomedical engineering from Purdue University and a Purdue grad having completed her BS in biomedical engineering in 2008. She then went on to complete a PhD in bioengineering at the UC Berkeley UCSF joint PhD program where she worked on developing artificial sensation for neural prostheses. Next, as a Simon Foundation postdoctoral fellow, she worked in the lab of Michael Stryker at UCSF studying state-dependent encoding of sensory information and neural activity patterns evoked by electrical stimulation. She joined Purdue in the fall of 2019 where her lab uses a combination of electrophysiology, two-photon imaging, and animal behavior to study natural and artificial sensory processing. And finally, from the Regan Street Institute and IU School of Medicine here in Indianapolis, we have Dr. Sean Granis, who will be speaking on big data, bigger impact, leveraging language models for research and healthcare situations. Dr. Granis is both the Vice President of Data and Analytics and a Biomedical Informatics Research Scientist at the Regan Street Institute, as well as the Regan Street Chair in Medical Informatics and a Professor of Family Medicine at IU School of Medicine. Dr. Granis collaborates closely with national and international public and population health stakeholders to advance the technical infrastructure and data sharing capabilities in varying settings. His research is focused on improving discovery and decision support in a variety of contexts by developing, testing, and implementing innovative approaches for data integration, patient ma matching, predictive modeling, and other novel data science use cases, including developing novel population health data frameworks, supporting fusion community and social determinants of health 
with clinical data, as well as leveraging machine learning-based models to improve discovery and decision support in a variety of contexts. Thanks to all of you for agreeing to be a part of this year's cross-campus talks. And now we'd like to get started by inviting Nancy up to the stage for her um, talk. Thank you. Don't need my computer. You just close it right up. Look, it's right there. Okay. You never know, right? Okay, here we go. Good morning. Thank you for those of you who responded. Um, so we're going to change gears a little bit, and I apologize. I usually move around quite a bit when I speak, but I'll try to stay central to this microphone. All right, here we go. Um, in February of 2022, Dr. Thomas Insel published a book entitled Healing, Our Path from Mental Illness to Mental Health. Now, I don't know Dr. Insel at all. All right, let's be clear about that. But the story that's told on his Amazon book page goes something like this. As the director of the National Institutes of Mental Health, Dr. Thomas Insel was given a pre giving a presentation when the father of a boy with schizophrenia yelled from the back of the room, our house is on fire and you're telling me about the chemistry of paint. What are you doing to put out that fire? Dr. Insel knew in his heart that the answer was not nearly enough. The gargantuan American health industry was not healing the millions who were desperately in need. He left his position atop the mental health research world to investigate all that was broken and what a better path to mental health might look like. Now, an interview around that same time, Insel is quoted to say, I wrote healing to give hope. That hope comes from the recognition that recovery is possible if we reframe mental health care to include not only the acute reduction of symptoms, but also a longer term commitment to the three P's, people, place, and purpose. I didn't understand this when I started the book. I was trying to figure out why with so many good treatments, outcomes were still not improving. The answer I conclude is that the problem is medical, mental illnesses are brain disorders, but the solution must be, must be much broader, including people, place, and purpose. And so while there will always be basic clinical discovery to make, right? The, the heart of this talk is really about partnership and translation, and that's the work that I do. I didn't know that this was possible. Let's start there. I had no idea that the job that I do now even existed. So a little bit of background about how we got here. I uh, joined the faculty at the University of Notre Dame in 2015 to help launch their neuroscience and behavior major. As you can see, this is my graph for my talk, right? Here it goes. As you can see, we started very small. It was the first cross-college collaboration that the university ever had. Uh, we had students that were able to declare the major in 2015. So our first graduating class was in 2018, and we've grown tremendously ever since. What does that have to do with anything? Well, around the time that I was joining the university, um, the, our, one of our major healthcare, the major largest healthcare provider in our area, uh, Beacon, Meta Beacon Health Systems, was also releasing their community health needs assessment, a community health needs assessment that they run every three years. So in 2015, their data were coming out that supported the data that they collected in 2012 with childhood abuse and adversity as the number two health concern for our community, second only to that of obesity. And so obviously, in a university whose mission is, uh, part of the mission is to aim, uh, create a sense of human solidarity and concern for the common good that will bear fruit as learning becomes service to justice. Right? It's beautiful, right? Obviously, these two things were a natural fit. Wait, what? <laughs> so maybe some of you are wondering, what on earth does neuroscience and community health have to do with each other at all? Right? All right. So here is the nutshell. We only have 15 minutes. What do they have to do with each other at all? Well, it turns out that we have like the human brain is this amazing, amazing organ. We have a very large number. In the adult human brain, we have over 100 trillion synapses or points of connection and communication between the approximately 172 billion cells that we have, neurons and the variety of glial cells. But a big question is, right, if our behavior emerges as a result of this function, a big question is, how do those synapses get there, right? 
Well, our brain is actually a situated organ. Yes, it's situated in our skulls, but from the moment that we are born, we're situated in a much broader context outside of ourselves. And that situation, our dependency, obligates us to look outside of ourselves for our means of survival for the first many, many, many years of life. And it's through these early interactions, why I place such critical importance on childhood, it's through these early interactions that that micro-architecture Right? The specificity and uniqueness of the synaptic architecture and the communication across different brain regions occurs. Right? So this is the tracing of the cortical development of a human, right? So they're the same number of neurons in each of these panels, but you can see that they're born, right? when we're born, they're like little seedlings. And then about three months of age, maybe they're like saplings. And then by two years of age, they're these massive trees, right? These early processes are critically important to developing how our brains understand the world, how our bodies then respond to the world around us. We have a tendency to then separate, right, when we go in for treatment, we have a tendency to separate our body into systems. We have a nervous system, we have an endocrine system, and our nervous system is divided into our peripheral system and our central system. And that peripheral system is autonomic and somatic. And that autonomic system is parasympathetic and sympathetic. And we tend to treat them based on those categories and classifications, right? And then while all of that is absolutely true, what we tend to neglect in that kind of siloed view is that the body is actually an integrated whole all of the time. We are top down and bottom up. We are nervous system and endocrine and immune. And my perception of the world, sculpted by my microarchitecture, has significant influence then on not only my nervous system function, but also my endocrine and immune function. The brain is not only a situated organ, but is an expectant organ. Every human nervous system is expectant of people, place, and purpose from the moment we are born until the moment we pass on. And foundational cellular seeking is this sense of person, people, place, and purpose, right? So much though, that when we start to write, there's a vast literature on the impact of adverse childhood experiences, these ACEs, right? That original study identified 10 experiences that one could have before the age of 18, that if they did, the likelihood of disease later on in life increased. The foundational need for people, place, and purpose is so extraordinary that when we start to fray away at it, right, as is in the case that we've studied so significantly with this ACEs conversation, or in other worlds where we talk about social correlates of health, when we start to fray away at these expectations, we land in the increase of the likelihood of landing in a disease state later on in life, okay? So to put it differently, if we could do a better job, so this is epidemiological data of attributable risk, if we could do a better job at providing systematically, community, individually, providing those foundational components of people, place, and purpose, we could eliminate 78% of IV drug use. We could eliminate 67% of suicide attempts, right? And maybe some of these more like mental health concerns might, you know, we can, we can reason them away, right? We still often kind of worked in a framework of these hard body and soft body problems as, as dichotomies to one another, right? But we are integrated wholes all of the time and our perceptions and understanding of the world influence our endocrine and immune function throughout our lifespan. So we can even see this attributable risk show up in things like cardiovascular disease and cancer, workplace injury, what? All of the ways in which people place in purpose matter so deeply to the expectations of the nervous system Right? If we could focus on repairing those, we could eliminate even large proportions of what we have historically thought of as these very clinical diseases. Okay. So that's the work that I do, right? We mobilize, well, there will always, 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 always be 
foundational discovery questions to ask. The brain is the most remarkably complex organ, as I demonstrated earlier, right? And there will always be surprises. But we cannot wait until we have the answers to all of those things before we work in partnership with our communities to start translating these foundational truths and principles of neurobiological function. The self-healing community's model was generated over off of over 20 years of data in Washington state where they kind of rethought what does community support look like? Well, let's lead with the evidence of near science, this neuroscience, epigenetics, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. That's an acronym and an acronym and a terrible idea. Near science, neuroscience, epigenetics, ACEs, and resilience. And what if we cross-checked all of the policy decisions that we made against this science? Because we can have really good intentions that actually work at a great distance from what the cellular expectations of health are. Okay. So we start with community at the center. I have no idea about anybody until I learned their story. Right, what's feasible? This is not a research to practice model. This is more like practice and relationship that lets us know what works. <laughs> but we can all absolutely do. The goal, the hope is that we can all take part in building strong communities and strong nervous systems by being the best protective factor possible. Right? And in 2023, when we're all distracted and busy and focused and looking down, you better believe that we, every single one of us, has an opportunity to step into what does it look like to live out these ideas of people, place, and purpose. Our regional coalition um, is supported in large part by uh, Notre Dame Neuroscience and Behavior and Beacon Community Impact. The mission of our specific self-healing communities of Greater Michiana is to nurture personal and community well-being through the neuroscience of human resilience and the celebration of our collective strengths. We focus, right, so the self-healing communities model is very clear that it is a living systems model, which means it will never be, if you do these things and plop it in your community, everything is going to work out great. It's a build on living and dynamic systems modeling, right? That understanding the, the, you know, the butterfly effect, that something that happens over here can have a giant effect over here and people in the middle might not even notice. Right? Our coalition is focusing on helping the helpers. All of those people in every community that do all of the heavy lifting of the care for the community. How, how do we do this? You might be wondering. Well, in a number of different ways, right? Again, this is not about trying to articulate how phosphorylation state changes the biochemical interjectance of, you know, uh, uh, biochemical components of like energy, right? What we're talking about is foundational principles. What are we, what are we really clear on about what the nervous system expects? We do this in a number of ways through professional development. We work with organizations specifically for these real deeper dives into what's happening. Often in our community, at least, it has to do with how we construct neurobiological safety and that relationship to principles of trauma-informed care. We write children's books with some additional resources, kind of unpacking what the characters in the books might be experiencing. These are aimed to be written at a level for emerging readers so that the idea is, is that they would have like a reading superhero along with them that might be more inclined to check out the stuff, the additional resources and guide those conversations. We create resources for individuals right? um, and we create resources specifically for uh, caregivers. Um, and again, these are the opportunities within each of these are then working with members, different members of the coalition to do those deeper dives because we know that it's not just about knowing stuff. It's about doing differently because of what we know, right? If we never take action on what we understand as these foundational truths of wellness, then we might wonder why we spend so much time discovering in the first place. So our job is really to motivate people to, to consider doing something different, to have a deep enough understanding of it, right? That you don't have to know all of the biochemistry or the cellular biology of it all, but that it has to, you have to know it in a level that makes it relevant and meaningful to you. We're currently working in partnership with the Indiana ACES Coalition and IYSA as well to make these resources more accessible and available across the state. Um, our data don't look like graphs. 
<laughs> most of the time. Um, our data exists in, in the stories of people. Um, again and again and again and again, the most common feedback that we get um, from individuals, so in terms of individual agency and human formation, um, it's like grace. Like when you were a kid and all that terrible stuff happened and everybody told you that it was fine because it happens to everybody, it was okay to be a sad kid, right? You can forgive that little kid. You can love that little kid, right? This idea of grace and forgiveness of self and others, which then really easily transitions into hope and agency and a perceived sense of self-control that wasn't present before. Um, our undergraduates are essential in this work. See, it all comes back full circle. We now have this massive undergraduate population, and they have a predisposition in thinking. Generally, you know, they're, they're, they select into, they opt into the University of Notre Dame. So most of our undergraduates have um, an idea of wanting to use their education in service to justice. That's kind of one of the things that we, we promise. Um, and so while I cannot take credit for these extraordinary human beings, I can say that their participation in this work um, definitely contributes to beautiful formation of the human and the human spirit. We've had three valedictorians and one salutatorian since 2019. In a community mindset, right, a lot of this work is kind of br bridging the gap between how we construct neurobiology of safety and how that applies to principles of trauma-informed care. In that organizational framework, we go from trauma-aware, trauma-sensitive, trauma-responsive, trauma-informed, but it's really easy to be like, okay, this is an organizational thing. We're doing this thing for the organization, right? And how many people have ever had an experience where like the words on the wall don't match what people do? Yeah, right? So we can say nice things all the time, right? And so this idea from a community mindset is this idea of, a, of being trauma-sensitive trauma as a personal pivot. I can know all day long that drama is a thing, right? It's not about what's wrong with you. It's about what's happened to you. But if that doesn't make me behave differently, then again, what we, we diminish the value of knowing, right? So what we call a traumatized sensitive mindset, the mindset shift. And again, in terms of organizational capacity, organizations that we work with implement then these strategies, right? We go through this trauma sensitive personal shift um, and then we see differences in, in policies, in, in hiring, in onboarding, in professional development. Curricularly, we're thinking about, we see the impact in our students. And so really thinking about how do we embed this opportunity much more kind of ubiquitously and holistically across a curriculum. So that's where, that's where impact shows up, right? It, because ultimately, change is up to us, right? Mobilizing principles of people, place, and purpose makes it actually really easy, right? That those of us that have, you know, the education in neuroscience or community health or biochemistry or immunology, right? we can talk shop and talk jargon all day long. But we as individuals and community members have to start behaving differently if the data that we generate is ever going to matter more broadly. This is a picture of a, of a cortical neuron, right? The most common way that people give up their power is thinking that they don't have any. If we remember anything tomorrow that we didn't know today, it's because we have new structures in our brain that support the, the maintenance and recall and integration of that information, right? It's about, we, and we have a hundred trillion, at least a hundred trillion of these. So knowing doesn't necessarily mean that things will be better, right? It's about what we do differently because of what we know that ultimately determines the impact for community health. Thank you so much.